I'm Billy Vance. Welcome to Bits and Bytes 2, Program 5, Messages, How to Move Information Between Computers. Whoa. Well, that's one way of networking computers. Very rapid file transfer, technically known as Frisbee Net. And if I jogged over to your desk with my floppy disk? Sneaker Net. But that's a much slower file transfer. There is a better way. Thanks. Plug our two computers together. Why didn't I think of that? Ah, but you'll notice it's a very special kind of cable. Well, it looks like my printer cable. Are these things all the same? Well, I think it's time to look around the back of your computer. Now, all these sockets are called ports. And some have nine pins and others have 25 pins. That's correct. But the important difference is that some are serial ports and some are parallel ports. Elucidate. Remember that computers speak in bits and bytes, and that a byte consists of eight bits. How could I ever forget? With parallel ports, the eight bits can march out of your computer side by side, one byte at a time. Now, that's pretty fast. With the serial ports, they march out in single file, one bit at a time, a whole lot slower. So, printer cables are usually parallel, which means that this... This could be either parallel or serial, as a matter of fact. But since parallel is faster, that's what we're using here. With 25 pins. Bingo. Now, always make sure your computer's switched off before you plug in a cable. OK. So. If there are two of us on computers in my office, we can exchange files. Well, provided you have a file transfer program. Assume there's one already installed. This one is called Laplink Pro. My computers can now zap their files to and fro electronically? I'm afraid your Frisbee days are over. Or you could simply use Laplink to copy stuff from the hard disk of your desktop computer directly onto the hard disk of your new laptop computer. Oh, you shouldn't have. I had to. Now, when you first use the Laplink program, you load it into both computers. If you're in their C drives, this is what you'll get on both of them. Desktop local. Oh, I get it. This is the C drive of my desktop, and on the right, we have laptop. And on this one, on the left, we have laptop local, and on the right, desktop. Suppose you want to copy a huge file from your desktop to your laptop, one that's too big to fit a floppy. On the right of your screen, move down to the word laptop and hit enter to get to drive C. Hit enter again. Now, let's say you want to send your balloons document file to your My Files directory. My Files? OK. Now, back to the desktop side of your screen to get the directory called Datavict and Word. To copy the balloons file, you just hit F2. F2. Your balloons file is three megabytes, so it'll take a moment to transfer. And there it is. Well, that's great for the odd occasion when I want to swap a lot of stuff between two computers. But how do I link a whole bunch of computers together? Now you're talking about what they call a local area network, a LAN, usually under the control of a central computer called a file server, a kind of oh, traffic cop, allowing people not only to share files, but to share the use of a laser printer, say, or, or some expensive software, or a large database. In the simplest terms, a LAN is a... Uh, some hardware and software. Uh, the, the, uh, the hardware is most notably some cable or wiring that connects to a, a group of computers. And the software really controls how those computers talk to one another. In the early days, uh, a LAN was justified on, on the basis of being able to share equipment. It became very quickly uh, obvious that not only do, can you share hardware and software, but uh, you're able to share information. And people started to trade. Um, uh, files and data, and uh, it then became obvious that it wasn't necessary to have many 
uh, copies of the same information on every uh, computer in everyone's office. A good example would be um, on this window that you see here. I don't actually have this software sitting on my computer. You have Excel, which is a spreadsheet, PowerPoint, which is a, a presentation package, electronic mail, Schedule Plus, which is a, an appointment manager and scheduler. Here's an example of a, of a scheduling application, and I, I can use this to maintain my personal uh, appointments, uh, departmental appointments, um, uh, for any uh, period of time uh, now and uh, in the future. And of course, I can keep a record of what I've done in the past. I want to uh, make a meeting with someone else in the organization. I would uh, open this uh, index and add a person. The gray indicates that he has some times booked. As I add people, their calendars appear, and it's, it's very useful in, in a work group uh, setting to be able to book meetings. I think that uh, the network is going to be uh, uh, very much a part of everyone's life um, in, very soon, and we think it, uh, as, a, as an organization, is something that we need to be uh, on top of right away and today. Is that how more and more people send office memos to each other now, over a LAN? That's right. By electronic mail, email. Let's suppose you and I are part of a LAN. You mean I could tell you to go fly a kite? Oh, I bet you'd like to do that, wouldn't you? Well, only in a memo. I mean, why stop at balloons? I'm branching out with a new line, kites. I'd like your comments, sir. All right, let's go. Hmm. Now I've got windows. Type Victoria. Right, and enter. Compose, reply, reply all, forward, compose to Billy Van. Hit the tab key. Subject, kite. We're launching a new line of kites. Any comments? How do I send it to you? Click on send. It says sent mail, but where is it? Well, I'll just have to check my inbox. I double click on it. Ah, here's your memo. To Billy Van, subject kites. We are launching a new line of kites. Any comments? All right, you need my comments? Okay. To Victoria, subject, kites, send me a picture. Click on window and then select inbox. Window, inbox, and there's your memo. How could I send you a picture in a memo? Wouldn't it be in my paintbrush program? No, that's right. But there's nothing to it. Even if it's in a different application? Doesn't matter. Microsoft Mail can integrate files from any application into your messages. Click on the little down arrow, top right. Click on File Manager to get your KitePic file. It's in the C drive. Now just drag the file into the mailbox icon. The paintbrush kite picture will now go into your memo. To Billy. Subject, kites. Here's the picture. Well, all I have to do is window, inbox, and there's your second memo with the paintbrush icon. And here's the picture. Voila! Wow! What a way to send a memo. What do I do with that first memo you sent me? Well, you could file it. Or scrap it. Well, some people have no respect. Yes, if you must. Okay, a window, inbox, and highlight my memo and drag it into deleted mail. Think of all the trees we're saving. The paperless office. 
So not only do I have to give up my Frisbee, I can't even fly paper airplanes anymore. <laughs> You'll have to wait till you're out of the office. Oh, what about outside the office? I mean, I've got branch plants all over the place now. I can't string cables to all of them. Well, you don't need to. They're already wired by the phone company. So I just plug my computer into the phone line? Well, not quite. Don't forget your computer is digital and the phone line is analog. Analog and digital are two different ways of describing quantity. If you ask a fisherman how many fish he has caught, and he holds up eight digits like this, he is describing the quantity of fish in a digital way. He's using separate individual digits to describe separate individual objects, which is fine, because this is a very clear-cut situation. You either catch eight fish or you don't. You can't catch a little less or a little more than eight fish. But if you ask the fisherman how big the fish was that got away, and he holds his hands up like this, he is describing the quantity of missing fish in an analog way. The distance between his hands is an analogy for the length of a fish. And this analog way of describing quantity is much more convenient than the digital way when you have to describe something that can vary continuously, given the elastic nature of the average fisherman's memory. In the world of machines, one of the commonest analog devices is a dimmer. The turning of the knob corresponds to the fading up or down of the light. It is a continuously variable device. The light can be more or less on. Contrast this with a light switch, which is the simplest digital device of all. The light is either on or off. Which brings us to that collection of on-off switches which is called a computer. Obviously itself a digital device, since it has to deal with everything in terms of binary digits. So my computer can't talk directly to the telephone because the telephone is analog. And the computer is digital. They just don't speak the same language. The computer speaks binary code, ones and zeros, whereas the telephone speaks in a series of tones. So you need to put a special black box between the computer and the telephone to transform or modulate computer talk into telephone talk. Then whatever you type in at your computer can go out over the phone lines and be understood by any other telephone. But before that telephone can send your message along to a second computer, another sort of black box is needed to transform or demodulate telephone talk back into computer talk. So once computer A has a modulator and computer B has a demodulator, A can send messages to B. But this is only one-way communication. B still can't send messages to A. To make it two-way communication, computer B needs a second black box to modulate its owner's message to you from computer talk to telephone talk. And computer A needs a second black box to demodulate that message from telephone talk back into computer talk. But to save having to buy two black boxes for each computer, a modulator and a demodulator, they can be combined into one box, a modulator demodulator or a modem. Once a computer is equipped with a modem, it can both send and receive messages to and from any other computer in the world that is also equipped with a similar sort of modem. Your modem, modem. Oh. More and more computers come with a built-in modem now, but we'll use an external one because it's easier to see how it works. This is communication, so it must plug into the serial communications port. That's right. Is the computer off? Good. But what are all these other wires for? Well, one is a power supply, already plugged in for you. The next one is connected to your phone, and the third one is connected to the phone outlet in the wall. So now my computer can talk to your computer over the phone? A cat may look at a king, but if they are to converse, a certain protocol has to be observed. 
What? Communication between computers over phone lines is very much like communication between heads of state and diplomats. There's a lot of protocol involved. Precise forms of ceremony and etiquette to be agreed upon. It's no good if one ambassador talks too fast. I beg to inform Your Excellency of my government's position concerning the offshore fishing rights of your herring fleet. Or if the other ambassador talks too slowly. I beg to respond. They must both talk at exactly the same speed. To avoid any misunderstanding that might lead to an unfortunate international incident, they must also check on the accuracy of what they're saying, as well as the exact length of each of their statements, and precisely how long they will pause between each statement. Finally, it must be clearly understood whether they will talk one at a time or simultaneously. So these are the five major communications parameters. Speed, accuracy, length, pause, one at a time or simultaneous. The electronic equivalents of these parameters are as follows. Number one, speed. This measures the number of bits flowing across the line known as the baud rate. This can vary from 2400 9,600, 19,200, or even higher. Number two, accuracy. You can check whether or not each byte of information you are sending is being received correctly by agreeing that there will be some sameness or parity to all the bytes. If you agree to add either a one or a zero to each byte to make all its ones add up to an even number, you have even parity. If you agree to make the ones in each byte add up to an odd number, you have odd parity. Either way, you know that if all the bytes received don't have the agreed upon parity, there must be something wrong. Number three, length. You must agree on how many data bits there are going to be in each of your bytes, either seven or eight. Number four, pause. Just as with telegrams, when you use the word stop to indicate where one sentence ends and another begins, with computer communications, you can use either one or two stop bits between each byte to make it clear where one byte ends and another begins. And number five, one at a time or simultaneous. Here you have the option of either one person talking at a time half duplex, or both talking simultaneously, full duplex. When two ambassadors first meet, they present their diplomatic credentials and shake hands to confirm that they'll both be observing the proper protocol. In the same way, when two computers equipped with modems first meet, they go through a process called handshaking. They whistle and screech at each other to confirm that they're both in sync. If everything matches up, they can start talking. If not, just as when two diplomats don't observe the same protocol, international relations break down. When two computers don't agree on the same protocol, their communications fall apart. How do I get my computer to be a good diplomat? Use a communications program. Try Procom Plus. I'll just exit out of all this. And there's Procom Plus for Windows. So, now I can get through to you? I'm in the book. See the open book icon on the far left? Uh-huh. Dialing directory, Billy Van, and your number, and... These are all communication parameters, which have been set at, uh, don't tell me, don't tell me, 9,600 baud, N for no parity bit, eight data bits, one stop bit, and F for full duplex. Hey, you've been taking smart pills, young lady. If I want to change the baud rate, what do I do? 
double click on it. Quite a range. The most widely used transmission rate on PCs now is 9600 baud. You might as well stick with that. Okay. What about the other parameters? Double click on them. Parity, none. Odd, even. Data bits, eight or seven. Stop bits, one or two. And duplex, full or half. Again, these are the most popular settings, so you can leave them as they are for now. So you have the same settings? That's right. And I'm in an answer mode, so my modem is ready to receive. This means I'm called the host. Are you using the same communications program? Yes, as it happens, but I don't really need to. Most of these programs can talk to each other, so get your computer to give me a call. You mean my computer can dial my phone for me, but they're not connected? They're both connected to the same phone line. Just click on dial at the bottom of the screen. Can I type something to you now? Can I send you a document about my new kites the way I sent you the memo and the picture over the network cable? Yes, but since there's lots of different types of information in files, you have to do more error checking than when we were simply chatting to each other. So the parity check is not enough? No. We need to use something called a file transfer protocol. Oh, no. Hey, relax. There are a whole bunch of ready-made ones. Click on the icon for the file folder with the up arrow. Oh, I see. Change protocol. Kermit, X modem, Y modem. These are the file transfer protocols I can choose from. That's right. It doesn't matter much which one as long as we both use the same one. I'm using Y modem. Okay, I'll use that too. Now find your kite document file. Click on OK to upload the file to me. Now, since you called me, I'm the host, and the host is always considered to be above the guest. Nothing personal there. It's a hangover from the days when dumb terminals used to communicate with host mainframe computers. Dumb terminals, eh? Like I said, nothing personal. I forgive you. Uploading. Have you got it? All present and correct. Are we still online? Well, the computer stays online until you tell it to hang up. Click on the telephone icon. Oh, I see. It's still off the hook. Cute. But all these parameters and protocols, it was much easier when we were just linked by cable. Yes, but the farthest any cable can stretch is about 100 feet. With a modem, the sky's the limit. Today, it's possible because of breakthroughs in, in both satellite technology and computer technology to put what years ago would have cost hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, in the corner of an office for a thousand or two thousand dollars to provide access to uh, an entire world of information. The satellite services that, uh, that we have in here uh, involve all the major news wires in the world. We receive information that uh, is news, sports, world weather, and at the same time lots of information about what's happening in commodity markets, uh, currency markets, and stock markets all over the world. The system uh, provides, uh, by simple satellite connection, uh, the receipt of all trades on 110 different stock exchanges around the world, every single trade. Uh, we receive in here about 25,000 stories a day from probably as many as 60 different news wires. Our ability to store and retrieve vast amounts of information to communicate it very rapidly uh, make us uh, much better decision makers. So uh, while, yes, the amount of information available to us is overwhelming, the, the tools we have to access it are also overwhelming. I'd like to try that. Okay, try an electronic bulletin board. There's one up on your computer that has all kinds of stuff on it. Oh, 
there are lots of things. Business, communications, database, education, games, graphics. <laughs> it goes on forever. This is just one of thousands of different bulletin boards across the continent, not to mention all kinds of online information services, such as Prodigy, CompuServe, Genie, America Online, Dialog. So, I've seen three main ways of moving information between computers. One, simple file transfer. Two, a LAN for sharing files and sending email. And three, using a modem over longer distances to chat, transfer files, or access a bulletin board or online service. Well, I guess you're ready to look at those specs again. 9600 baud modem, two serial, and one parallel port. I know what all that means now. In fact, I know what the whole thing means except for Super VGA. The last remaining piece in the jigsaw puzzle, my dear Watson, which we will slot into place in the final program of our series when we look at graphics and multimedia. I'm Billy Vance. And I'm Victoria Stokel.